the Song of Solomon. And tonight I'm going to be on the, the marriage theme for just a few minutes. You know, again, uh, and, and I think you'll see this as we go along. There is, uh, man, there's just, it really doesn't matter what subject you hit in the Bible. As you begin to explore what God says about it, you know, there's always applications for all sorts of things. You learn, you learn all sorts of things in many different directions. So uh, I trust that it'll be like that tonight as well. Song of Solomon, chapter 8. Verse 6, Chris, you know what the Song of Solomon is? Man, it is a love story from the first verse to the last. It is a very passionate love story. Um, Song of Solomon 8, verse 6. Set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm. For love is strong as death. Now he's talking about true love there. For love is strong as death. Jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are coals of fire, which hath the most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would utterly be contemned. Father, thank you, Lord. Help us as we look at these verses. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, and an, uh, how many of you, uh, I, I know most of you do, how many of you know what an encyclopedia is? All right. I was preaching in, in Prince Albert years ago, and I was quoting someone, and I said, this is the encyclopedia age. And when I said that, I saw this doctor and his wife, they look at each other and they chuckled. It's like, we're way past encyclopedias, you know. But you know, when when we were kids, that was the thing, and everybody had encyclopedias. That was the the um, That was the internet of the day. That was the the books of knowledge. Um, You know, they had encyclopedias over 200 years ago. And an encyclopedia from over 200 years ago had five pages on the word love. The word Adam, A-T-O-M, the scientific thing, had four lines. A recent book of information had five pages on the word Adam, A-T-O-M. The word love did not appear. Wow. That tells you a lot about our society. In verse 6, it says, love is strong as death. You know, um, there is no escaping death of course, except for the rapture, and we are hoping that we will be that one great exception to the rule. Um, But barring that exception, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Any of you that know anything about death, any of you that have tasted it, you know, watching a loved one or whatever, um, death is final. Um, Death, there's just there's just no escape. No, nobody, nobody gets to that last heartbeat and, and suddenly finds a way around it. Um, death is binding. Nobody ever steps into the grave and ever comes out, except, of course, our Lord. Um, death holds people in its grasp, and barring the resurrection, they would never be released. Death is powerful. Um, love is strong as death. There must be an unchanging, lifelong commitment. In 1 Corinthians 13, 8, it says this about love. And of course, we'll, we'll probably look at that, that chapter in a, in a minute or two. Um, but you know what it says about charity, which is God's love, because it's certainly that chapter is not about man's love. God's love, it says, charity never faileth. Love is as strong as death, if it is love as God defines it. We know, we know, we understand. There are tragedies, there are divorces, there are divorces that people didn't want, and we understand all that. But, but, but for, for the next few minutes, we are speaking now in the sense 
of God's plan for marriage as he intended it to be. So bear that in mind, okay? Um, he intended that that love would be strong as death. Death is binding. Death is powerful. Death is final. He intended that the love that would exist between a man and a woman, which is what the book of Song of Solomon is all about, he intended that that love would be a lifelong, unalterable commitment. Uh, many years ago, um, I was somewhere, and uh, this, this guy got up and preached, and he's a really, really great old preacher. And um, I don't even remember what he was preaching on that night, but he got off on this subject. And he says, you know, a lot of people say, if I had only married the right one, and he said, well, he said, I don't know who you're married to tonight. But he said, if you're still married to him, they are the right one. They are the right one. Till death. Till death do us part. Look at 1 Corinthians 13. Now, that can be sweet and it can be terrible. I heard one guy say, he was joking, but he said, he said, the average life sentence is 16 years. He said, I'm on my second life sentence. <laughs> and then he said, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. You know, I think some people feel trapped, but you know, um, but you know, that's, that's, that's not at all how God intended it to be. First Corinthians 13 verse one, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity. I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, he said, it doesn't matter how much you know or how much of a Bible scholar you are. He said, yeah, that just really, in the big scheme of things, he said, if you have all that, verse 2, and though I have all faith that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. Vaunteth means, it means to make a vain display of your own worth or your own attainments, okay? Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly. Unseemly means... Um, um, in a way that's not fit or becoming or indecent, okay? Um, verse 5, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Charity never faileth. Um, years ago, I knew an evangelist, and, and he was a friend of mine, and he's, he's with the Lord now. And, um, and I, I, had, uh, I, I knew his kids. I didn't really know him personally, but, um, but I'd seen them at meetings. And um, his oldest daughter married a guy in Bible school. Um, again, you know, our tendency is to think that that would really be, um, you know, you think, man, if there's a, if there's a fail safe place to find a mate, you think that's the place. I, I'm not, I'm not knocking that at all. I, I really think you ought to try to find your mate in a safe place, you know, going downtown, you know, to the, the dancers club on Friday night, that's probably not a real good place to find somebody, you know. So I, I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. Many people have found their husband or wife at a place like that. I found my wife there. Um, but she married a guy. I didn't catch that. At Bible school. At Bible school. Not, yeah, not at the club. <laughs> not at the club. <clears throat> Thank you for clarifying. I'm sure everybody was wondering. So this evangelist daughter she, she married a guy in Bible school, and they were married for, you know, a year or two or three, and uh, she had her first child. She gained a lot of weight with that first child, which sometimes happens, and, you know, sometimes they lose it, sometimes they lose part of it, sometimes they struggle, some, you know, it's just one of those things. Um, she, she gained a lot of weight, 
And she had trouble losing it. Like she had real trouble losing it. And so I kid you not, he divorced her. And of course, when he divorced her and he got in court, he said she was part of a cult and, you know, and the, the accusations just went wild because he had to justify his actions. She almost lost the children. Uh, by the time, I think by the time they divorced, they had three children. And, um, and man, people were praying everywhere that she wouldn't lose those children because the, the judge was not looking. You know, as much as the court usually favors the woman because, you know, he was making all these accusations, it really got touch and go whether she was going to lose the kids or not. And thank God, by the grace of God, um, finally, the judge ruled in her favor. Think about that guy for a minute. He sucker punched her. She thought she was getting the cream of the crop. Love is strong as death. But what did he love? Well, he loved a pretty body. And his love stopped when his estimate of her beauty dropped. He loved his own pleasure. He did not love her. He loved um, it wasn't God's idea of love. He didn't love the Lord, though he would claim the opposite. He loved himself. And God said that is a mark of the last day. Second Timothy 3, they will be lovers of their own selves. Um, if you're going to be sweethearts for the long haul, and that's, that's what this message, the title of this message. If you're going to be sweethearts for the long haul, you're going to have to really believe that this is for the rest of my life. This is a lifelong commitment. There must be no plan of escape. There must be no escape hatch, you know, where you're thinking, well, you know, under certain conditions, if I need to, I, you know what? That message is doomed to failure because you're already planning. You say, well, pastor, people don't do that. Oh, you'd be surprised. There's a gal we know in this province, and uh, she's, she's happily married and got children now, but before she married the guy that she married, there was another guy that showed an interest in her, and a guy that was several years older than her, and um, she was from a good church here in this province, and, um, and so they begin to write letters back and forth, and I'm going to quote from one of his letters. Are you ready? He said, I'm preparing myself that if you do this or that, I will need to divorce you. You know what he's doing? He was preparing his trap door. His escape hatch. Mitzi and I, years ago, when we started the deputation trail and we were going to come to Canada and all that, for a number of years, we were with a mission agency that mission agency was called Word for the World Baptist Ministries. And they were really, really a good outfit. And, um, but, you know, every year missionaries would apply to, um, to go through them. And, um, and so they would interview the missionaries, you know, during the, they'd have this week of candidate school. And, um, and they would interview the missionaries, the, the, the prospective missionaries as part of the process. And, um, so they've got this husband and wife in there. I'll never forget Mitzi and I sitting in that room with all those preachers, you know, up, up against the wall, you know, and, and uh, you know, you, you sort of feel like, you know, you're very, I was very intimidated. I was, um, I was about 23, 24 years old. And I remember them looking at Mitzi and said, so what do you think about all this? You willing to follow him? Do, do you think he's really, they started asking her questions. And that's a wonderful thing. It is. And there was one candidate there that they began to interview. And as they interviewed him, they asked him, they said, so, you know, with, with, with his wife sitting right there, they said, so is your wife on board with this? Because, you know, that's really critical. You know, it just, <laughs> it's really critical. And he said something like this. Quote, if she chooses not to follow me, I will divorce her and go on. And he said it as though he got, he'd think they would fully approve. 
You see, a lot of people do in their, somewhere in the dark corners of their mind, they've got a trap door. They've already, they've already figured out what they're going to do if. God said, no, love is strong as death. Look at that, uh, go back to Song of Solomon, and let's catch the next phrase there. Song of Solomon 8. You say, how, how strong should my love be? Well, I think you got a, a, a pretty, pretty solid line there. You know, you, 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 you can really get, wrap your head around that measurement. It is strong as death. Verse 6. Jealousy is cruel as the grave. You know, you're going to have to have, you're going to have to have, first of all, a, a lifelong uh, commitment. But secondly, you're going to have to have a total loyalty. A total loyalty. Um, jealousy is good and normal. But when I say that, I do not mean extreme or insane jealousy. And there's some people that, uh, um, you know, it's just, it's just off the chart. You know, every time, every time their wife goes to the grocery store, you know, they, they give her the third degree when she gets back or vice versa. You know, there is a, there is, and you say, well, wait a minute, pastor, didn't it say it's cruel as a grave? Yeah, because, because uh, when you read, um, God does some great acts of judgment out of jealousy. I want you to look at some verses with me. Um, I want you to look at Exodus 34, and we're going to fly through this. If you're writing verses down, I'm going to give you several references to write down. You can look them up on your own time. Exodus 34, but we'll look at a few. Jealousy is cruel as the grave. And the thought is, the thought is that you ought to conduct yourself in such a way that there is never a cause for jealousy. That's the thought, okay? Um, you're in Exodus 34, right? Okay, Exodus 34, let's look at verse 14. Now, this is God speaking. For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is, capital J, Jealous, is a jealous God. If I ask you for some of the names of God tonight and you didn't know where I was going tonight, I, I, really, I really doubt that any of you would call out this word. You would have many names for the Lord. You, you guys know many names for the Lord. Um, and to be honest, if I was sitting in a congregation and they asked for names of the Lord, I don't know that this name would come to my mind either. But the Lord said, this is one of his names. His name is jealous. So if you're writing down references... Um, you don't have to, but if you are, I'm going to give you several real quick. Ready? Deuteronomy 4.24. Deuteronomy 5.9. Deuteronomy 6.15. Joshua 24.19. On your own time, you ought to look at those verses. All right? So um, let's go to Ezekiel 39. Ezekiel 39. And this is, you know, one of those amazing passages in light of everything that's going on. But I want you to see a thought that shows up in this, in these verses. Ezekiel 39, verse 23. And the heathen shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity. So I got a question. Did the church ever go into captivity for her iniquity? No, you guys know as well as I do that, that this is a very clear reference to Israel. Okay, so, so same, same sort of deal. You know, if you're going to take the, the judgment, you have to take the blessing too. Okay, so just, just saying. All right. Um, because they transgressed against me, therefore hid I my face from them and gave them into the hand of their enemies. So, they, so, they, so fell they all by the sword. According to their uncleanness and according to their transgressions have I done unto them and hid my face from them. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Now will I bring again the captivity of Jacob, and have mercy upon the whole house of Israel, and will be jealous for my holy name. After that they have borne their shame and all the trespasses where they have trespassed against me, when they had dwelt safely in their land, and none made them afraid, 
When I brought them again from the people and gathered them out of their enemies' lands and am sanctified in them in the sight of many nations. Now, all of a sudden, well, you see from the wording, this has got to be out there in the future somewhere. Okay? So there's a time coming. There's a time coming when 27, 28, and 29 will be a living reality. Okay? When I brought them again from the people and gathered them out of their enemies' lands and am sanctified in them in the sight of many nations, then shall they know that I am the Lord their God, which caused them to be led into captivity among the heathen. But I have gathered them unto their own land and have left none of them any more there. Neither will I hide my face any more from them, for I have poured out my spirit upon the house of Israel, saith the Lord God. Notice the, the end of verse 25, the second half of the verse. The Lord says, He will have mercy upon the whole house of Israel and will be jealous for my holy name. One of the things you see there is that... Um, God's name is tied into the restoration of Israel. And the glory of his name will do this. He will see to it that his promise is fulfilled and Israel and the host of heaven will give him all the glory because his name is tied into this. I want you to uh, look real quick, quick, quickly with me at Exodus 20. Exodus 20. We're going to fly here for just a minute. Exodus 20 verse 5. Exodus 20. Exodus 20, verse 5. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and to the third and fourth generation and the, of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Notice, um, he says, For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. Now, I want you to see that in the context of a love relationship. And really, that's why the Lord says this. But I want you to see it. Look at Isaiah 57. Isaiah 57. Verse 7. The Lord is uh, speaking and he is condemning uh, the Jews' idolatry here. And um, just he's just really very, very specific, very hot, very angry here. And um, look what he says, verse 5, inflaming yourselves with idols under every green tree, slaying the children in the valleys under the cliffs of the rocks. That was one of the things that was going on was idolatry in its extremity. Um, they actually got to the place where they were slaying their own children. Okay, verse 7, upon a high, upon a lofty and high mountain hast thou set thy bed. Okay, now so now he's talking about adultery, both spiritual and physical. Hast thou set thy bed? Even thither wentest thou up to offer sacrifice. Behind the doors also and the posts hast thou set up thy remembrance. For thou hast, here it is, discovered thyself to another other than me. And art gone up, thou hast enlarged thy bed and made thee a covenant with them. Thou lovest their bed where thou sawest it. He's talking about adultery here. And he says, he says, you know, you were supposed to be for me. And he says, you have uncovered yourself to others. And you see the jealousy of God as the great lover of Israel. And he is furious because they have played the harlot. And he's not just looking to kill him because he's just having a bad day. He's jealous because he has been betrayed. Two more verses to write down. Nahum chapter 1 verse 2, it says the Lord revengeth and is furious, and it says he is jealous in that verse. Nahum 1 verse 2 and Zechariah 1 14, and there's many others you could look at. Okay, so I want you to go now to 2 Corinthians 11. And if you missed any of those references, come and ask me after. 2 Corinthians 11. Again, this is a principle, you know, when you, when, you, when you pull a lot of verses from the Old Testament, you know, there's this thing that goes on, and, and it, is, it is valid. But some people say, well, pastor, you know, that's Old Testament, that's Old Testament. And it is. But you, and, and there are some truths that are purely Old Testament. But there are many truths that, are, that um, describe the character of God. Whenever something describes the character of God, you will find it runs from one end of the Bible to the other. Okay, so look at 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. Now, we have referred to this verse several times in the last few weeks. 
but I want you to read it with me for a reason, okay? 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3, But I fear, Paul says, lest by, the ser- as, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, and he goes on. But what's the context of those verses? Look at verse 1 and 2. Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you, that's a term for engagement, I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And he said, but I'm afraid that you're going to go for the wrong one. And he says, I am jealous. I am jealous. There needs to be a total loyalty. Write down um, Numbers chapter 5. Just write down Numbers chapter 5 if you're taking notes. And it tells what to do when the spirit of jealousy came on a man. So I'm just going to tell you, you can read the chapter. It is an amazing chapter. And it tells you something. Boy, there's things people miss that never read the Bible through. You know, if you're always reading your favorite spots, there's just some amazing things you're going to miss. And you read this, and God gives a whole chapter to this guy who he's jealous, and he doesn't even know why. This spirit comes over him, and suddenly he feels like his wife is up to something. And he says, here's the way you test that. You know, it's interesting in the spiritual realm. There are things that happen that sometimes you'll just sense, and it's not foolproof, as you find out in that chapter. But sometimes it's very valid. We talk about a woman's intuition. You know, sometimes a woman, you know, as a husband, you know, sometimes I, I know you guys aren't like this, but sometimes, you know, I'm a little clueless. And, um, and my wife will say something. And I'm like, really? And, uh, and sometimes she's just got a sixth sense about something. And you know what that is? That's that, that's something that's going on in the spiritual realm. Some people really are in tune with that. And again, it's never infallible. But sometimes it's amazing. You just sense something. Oh, man, you women, you would understand this. How many times have my daughters came to me and they said, Dad, so-and-so gives me the creeps. Some man, some Christian man, they get around him. Did he do anything? No. But there was something about his spirit and they sensed it. In Numbers chapter 5, you got this man, and this spirit of jealousy comes on him. He thinks his wife is messing around. Has he seen anything? Has he heard anything? No. But he goes to the priest. He sets her in front of the priest. The priest, under the direction of God, mixes up this stuff, and, um, and she has to swear before God that she has not committed adultery. And then she drinks this stuff. And if she is lying, literally she dies. I don't know if she dies within minutes or within the hour, but her belly rots, her thigh swells, and she dies. Wow. And God said, now, if she's in the clear, she'll make that promise. She'll drink that stuff. She'll walk away just fine. It's interesting, though. God made provision for that. You and I, you know, and some of you young people, you're gonna, when you're going to be married, you, you need to conduct yourself. You need to be so loyal and so trustworthy and so steering clear of questionable situations that there will be no occasion for jealousy. You need to be going out of your way to be clean and clear of any true charge in this matter. You know, like, you know, all of a sudden you're having these long phone calls with some some other woman or some other man. You know, or or suddenly there's this man or this woman, you know, and and there's just, you know, this this innocent touching that's going on, you know, or or you're receiving their touches, you know, and it's like and somebody else is going, "Um, what is this?" You know, that shouldn't happen. Um there was a guy in, in the church in Northern Ontario that we, uh, we attended. And, um, 
and him and his wife both attended the church, and, and he was pretty carnal. And um, he, uh, he wanted to take a female co-worker out for lunch on her last day of work. But he hadn't taken his own wife out in a long time. And she was hot. And you know what? I, I, don't, I mean angry. And you know what? She had every right to be. Every right to be. That should not be. Um, I got a friend of mine, a couple from Bible school, no less. And uh, they, were, they were really good friends of ours. They got married in Bible school and all this stuff. And he got a, he got a really good job and, and uh, worked in a certain given area. And I'm trying to be careful because I don't know how, I, you never know who this is going to get back to. And it got this thing where, you know, he was, he was always late coming home. And he worked long hours and he was a supervisor. But sometimes he would weirdly go into work in the middle of the night. And then he didn't want her to show up in his workplace. You know, like sometimes, you know, you know, oh, honey, you know, can you bring me this? Can you bring me that? And, um, and so he would arrange for somebody to meet her. Well, this wasn't a high security zone. Everybody knew his wife. And it was just, it was just um, you know, and he said, well, you know, I, I don't really think you should be in my workplace. But none of his coworkers felt that way. And, you know, he was having lunch with another lady at work. He was witnessing to her. And Mitzi said to me, I bet he's messing around. And sure enough, he was. Um, there must be a total loyalty. Absolutely. You know, if, if, if your wife or your husband is, is doing something, you know, and it bothers you, you, you need to tell them. And, you, and whoever's receiving that piece of information, you need to honor that. You need to honor that. Some of you know uh, the Dobles. Uh, they were from Lacombe. And uh, a number of years ago, Darcy Doble's wife passed away. She had cancer and she had it for a number of, it seemed like she had it for a few years. And, um, you know, as she deteriorated, it became Darcy's job to, you know, do his best to take care of her. And, um, man, there were hard days. There were rough years as she battled cancer. And, you know, she paid him one of the highest compliments before his death, before her death. Um, she made this statement. She said, quote, Darcy has been so loyal. You want to be sweethearts for the long haul? That's the way it should be. Look back at our text in Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon 8, verse 6, it says, um, Set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm. For love is strong as death, jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are coals of fire, which hath the most vehement flame. Um, there must be a feeding of the fire. You know, God intended that love be uh, intense. You know, and I realize, you know, um, there's, there's ups and downs and not every day is the same and all that stuff. But um, God, God intended that that love and that that affection would not wane. It would not become blasé. It would not become, you know, just, um, oh, yeah, 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 there's Mr. Smarty Pants just walked in the door, you know, and, and you know, oh, yeah, Grumpy just walked in the door, and, you know, and, oh, yeah, I don't, I don't need to go home. You know, he'll, he'll figure it out. And, oh, you just sense this. I, I, mentioned, um, I mentioned here a few services ago about that East Indian couple and how they, um, you know, it was, that, it was that contract marriage and how they had to learn to love each other. Well, what struck me about them was that here they were, we were meeting them years later uh, up in Northern Ontario, and you could tell when they were around each other, <laughs> you could tell they loved each other. And I, I, it wasn't because they had their hands all over each other, not in public. Uh, they, it, it wasn't really like that. But you know you can just pick it up. You know what I mean? The way she looked at him, and the way he looked at her and their body language, you thought, wow, 
These people still love each other. God said his plan is that it would be a most vehement flame. Vehement means dictionary, acting with great force, red hot, very eager, very urgent. It is the opposite of blasé. It's the opposite. You know, life moves on and, and you know, you get, you know, you, you get used to each other and all that stuff, but you know, there's, there needs to be a feeding of the fire. And, and, you know, I think as men, um, you know, we all got to work this. Um, I always use the illustration of, of cutting firewood up North and uh, we burned a lot of firewood cause that was our, that was our main source of heat. And, um, and you know what? You were always feeding that fire. But it sure made for a warm, cozy place in a cold world. You know, um, you don't want to kill the fire. You know, you do a lot of damage with your words. You know, you act like you don't care. You take it for granted. All that stuff. And that can happen on both sides of the coin. Okay, I'm not knocking one or the other. Um, but I am saying this. I've, I've seen some couples. You've seen it too. And, and really, man, there's been no effort to feed the fire. The Lord said, let it be a most vehement flame. Feed the fire. The only way you get a red hot fire is you feed it. You feed it. Look at Song of Solomon 8, verse 7. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods, the floods drown it. Look at Isaiah 43 real quick. Isaiah 43. Just go to your right. Just a few pages. You'll see Isaiah. Isaiah 43. Now, I, I, I throw all this out there to you tonight, and, you know, I, I bear in mind, and I often say this because I don't want to discourage anybody. You know, nobody's perfect. No husband is perfect. No wife is perfect. No marriage is perfect. But you know what? There's some things you can do. There's some things that we can do that will make all the difference in the world. And you know what? God expects us to do those things. He really does. Look at verse 7. I'm sorry. Isaiah 43, verse 2. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Boy, the waters in Scripture, he said in the book of Psalms, he talked about when the waters roar and are troubled. You know, um, um, many waters, many waters is often a picture of trouble. Um, there needs to be a togetherness in trouble. Job chapter 5, verse 7. Man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. Job 14, 1. Man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. Look at Ecclesiastes. You're there, in, uh, maybe you're there in Song of Solomon. Just go back to just a couple pages and look at Ecclesiastes 11, verse 7. A togetherness in trouble. If you're going to be sweethearts for the long haul, man, there's got to be a lifelong commitment. There's got to be a true loyalty. There's got to be a feeding of the fire. And there needs to be a togetherness in trouble and in anticipation of trouble because trouble will come. Look at Ecclesiastes 11, verse 7. I love these verses. I love the book of Ecclesiastes. Some people find it depressing, but I, but I find so much reality. And yet this was the wisest man that ever lived. And um, look at verse 7, Ecclesiastes 11, verse 7. Truly the light is sweet, and a pleasant thing it is for the eyes to behold the sun. I was sitting on my couch the other morning and uh, in my very active state, and I was sitting there uh, with my foot propped up, looking out the window, and the sun was shining and I said this to the Lord. I said, oh, Lord, truly the light is sweet. And a pleasant thing it is to behold the sun. Verse 8. But if a man live many years and rejoice in them all, and that's what we're all hoping for, yet let him remember the days of darkness, for they shall be many. I have never liked that verse but I have found it true. 
It doesn't mean that it's all sad and it doesn't mean it's all dark. He says, you may live many years and rejoice in them all. I love the end of Psalm 90. Oh, Lord, make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us and the years wherein we have seen evil. Make us glad. Oh, satisfy us early with thy mercy. I, I take those verses to the Lord often. I think he likes it. But the Lord said, even if I give you a lot of good days, he said, just remember, there will still be days of darkness. He said, it's part of your lot on earth. In Dryden, Ontario, a number of years ago, we knew a young couple and um, his name was uh, Brother Anderson. I think his name was Ken Anderson. And I don't remember his wife's name. And um, they were in their 30s. And Brother Ken Anderson was a neat guy that loved the Lord. And uh, him and his wife loved the Lord. They were on fire for the Lord. And you know what? He got cancer in his 30s. And he hovered between life and death for a while. And he was on chemo. And um, a friend of mine was their pastor. And he said, you know, he said, I've walked into that house and he said she had Ken on the couch in her lap. And she said Ken was so weak he couldn't even feed himself. And she said, I have watched him. She said, I've, I have watched her spoon feed him. And she did this for some time. And she was glad to do it. And he lived and recovered. There's some dark days, but they were together. Oh, what a difference that makes. So many in times of extreme hardship have a mate that walks away. Sometimes it's because their mate is in a car wreck and they're paralyzed. Or sometimes their mate is in a car wreck and becomes disfigured. You know, maybe they're burned and they're hideous. And, and they walk away. Did you know that, that people that lose a child, the statistic is that 90% of those marriages don't survive? Nine out of 10 of those marriages do not survive. There must be a togetherness and there must be an anticipation of trouble. It doesn't mean you're living on gloom, you know, because God knows we sure don't need any more of that. But, um, but you know, it, it shouldn't totally take us by surprise. Trouble will come. And, and you need to just pray. You know, I do. I pray. I pray for the best. Oh, man, you talk about utopian prayers. I pray for the best. And can I tell you, can I tell you, you that laugh at me, <laughs> can I tell you that God has answered many of my utopian prayers? You know why he did that? Just because he's good. And he just looked down and said, look at that. Look at that, Gabriel. That's crazy what he's asking. But he thinks I can do it. Let's do it. I can't tell you how many times I've seen that. I'm a happy camper. We sang, is there anything too hard for God to do? Is there aught beyond his power? Not that I know of. But trouble will come. The question is not if. The question is when. And you just need to be together. You just need to say, well, no matter what happens, we're together. The last phrase is verse 7. Song of Solomon 8, verse 7. I know that God still answers prayer. I know he does. He sure does. Song of Solomon 8, verse 7. And this last phrase is really amazing. It says, if a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would utterly be contemned. You know, you have to have the right estimation of love. The right. How, how big a deal is love? How big a deal is it? Some people, they just have this attitude, well, you know, I can take it or leave it. Well, you know, God says, God says that that's not real smart. 
God says it's worth more than just about anything else. Howard Hughes was that multi, multi, multi millionaire, probably billionaire. I didn't look it up. But in his day, in, in my youth, he was one of the richest men that ever lived. He was a lost man, of course, and he had several failed marriages. Um, he had so much money um, that um, he, he would, it, it, was, it was hard. Somebody gave me the figures one time. You would be challenged to even spend the interest on a daily basis on his money. Like he was making thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars every day just in interest. And he says, you'd be hard pressed to even spend that money. But he said this, I would give all my wealth for one successful marriage. Just one. Look at Proverbs 15. You know, some of you are blessed a lot more than you realize. Proverbs 15. Proverbs 15, verse 17. And you know this verse, but it's really true. Proverbs 15, verse 17. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is. God says, if you're poor as dirt and you got love, he said, you are better off, verse 17, than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. Hey, the stalled ox, that's a picture of, man, you, you, you know, you got, you got meat in the freezer, you're, you're, you're set. God said, it's better to have love and be poor as dirt than to have everything and not have love. Consider, ladies or men, I wouldn't want a woman like this. If a man or a woman said, you know what? I'm going to marry you, and I really don't love you, but I'll give you lots of money and gifts. Would you be satisfied with that? I'll buy you sports cars. I'll buy you trips around the world. I'm not going to love you, but I'll give you anything you want. You know, there's no substitute for love. It is worth more than all earthly possessions. It is obvious that many put a low value on love, but the right value of love will give your children security. You know, there's nothing harder. I, I remember watching mom and dad. I didn't see it very often, but there was two or three times I saw mom and dad, wow, and it got the, the fight is on, oh, Christian soldier. And I saw it. I just saw it a couple times. You talk about something that rocked my world. Nothing rocked my world, but that did. The right value of love will give your children security. It will give them a model to follow. It will cause your face to shine. If you had to choose between all material things and real love, God says you better choose love. So if you'll have a lifelong commitment, you know, if you'll view marriage in this way, it is a lifelong commitment. There must be a true loyalty. You're going to feed that fire as long as you live. There's going to be a togetherness in trouble. And you're going to estimate that love right at the top. If you do that, you will have what God intended. And you will be sweethearts for the long haul. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you, Lord, for this sweet truth. Bless it to us, Lord. Lord, there's people out there that are watching and listening. God, may it, be a, may it be a help, Lord. May it be help to everybody in this room. Lord, may it be a help to the folks that are yet in this room that are going to be married in the next few years, Lord, should you tarry. Lord, I pray for all of us, Lord, in this room tonight. And um, God, would you help us? Would you help us, Lord, that we would all 
just have the right perspective on this, Lord, that we would see it like you see it, Lord. Lord, would you, would you make us a delight to our husband or to our wife, Lord? Would you make our marriage a delight to our children? Lord, would you help our children to know, Lord, how important these things are? Lord, would you help us? In Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I want to give you just a minute to talk to the Lord. Lord, you know the devil hates marriages, and he hates our marriages, and he hates the marriages of the people that love thee. Lord, we ask that you'd protect us. And Lord, if there's any marriages in our church, Lord, that are in trouble, God, we would pray, please, Lord, in Jesus' name, please help them greatly as only you can do. And God will give you the glory, and they'll give you the glory, and Lord, it'll just be a glorifying thing to you, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.